Here are the top 10 trades of all time. Buying, shorting, selling. These are words that live in every trader's mind rent free. Now, when it comes to the trades themselves, there are way too many to keep track of. However, we've got a few epic ones that have made their way into the history book. So without further ado, here are the top 10 trades of all time. At number 10, we have Jesse Livermore, the 1929 short. Jesse Livermore is widely credited as one of the world's top pioneers when it comes to shorting the market. The man has had an amazing track record, starting with his very first attempt when he focused on selling Union Pacific right before the 1906 San Francisco earthquake. He made around 250,000 pounds from this trade, which was worth a lot more back then than it is now. However, this was only the beginning as he also shorted the market in 1907, right as the stock market crashed, earning him 1 million pounds this time. He didn't do much right after, but came back stronger than ever in 1925 when he targeted the wheat industry. This made him $3 million in profit which would have been enough to classify him as a legend. But the best was yet to come. The Dow Jones Index was up 5x in early autumn of 1929, so everyone was euphoric. Today is Apart from Livermore, he saw what the others couldn't see, which was the amount of outstanding loans. They'd gotten to the point where their cumulative value was more than the amount of money in circulation at the time. Come September, the stocks began leveling out, and this gave Livermore his cue to place his biggest gamble yet, shorting the entire U.S. market. The rest was history, as the U.S. financial sector went into a complete meltdown and had everyone in a state of panic. Uh, every, it's a panic. Everyone's in panic. Everybody was trying to find a bottom. Apart from Livermore. He had made a whopping $100 million, which would equate to an estimated $1.8 billion today. Outstanding, isn't it? That's why it's so hard to believe that Livermore was declared bankrupt and banned from the Chicago Board of Trade in 1934. That's an interesting story as well, but maybe I'll cover it in my next video. And number nine, Paul Tudor Jones, shorting Black Monday. Black Monday may have happened in October 1987, but a certain trader by the name of Paul Tudor Jones saw it coming well before that. Jones was something of an oddball, as he got bored of trading, despite making good money. He then enrolled at Harvard Business School only to pull out at the very last minute to resume his work on commodities and trades. I had, by the time I uh, graduated from college, I already had probably at least a master's in probabilistic theory. By 1980, Jones founded the Tudor Investment Group and became a successful macro fund manager. In 1987, Jones noticed a suspicious overvaluation in oh. some stocks, so he decided to dive deeper into these discrepancies with his second-in-command, Peter Borish. After hours and hours of research, using the previously mentioned Wall Street crash of 1929 as a reference point, Jones managed to lay the foundation for one of the biggest trades in history. Two weeks before the fateful day, the Tudor Investment Group started trading aggressively against the market, while everyone else remained clueless about the massive bubble that was going to burst. Then came the 19th of October, 1987, when the Dow Jones had dropped by a massive 22% in one single day, recording the largest ever percentage drop at the time. In the midst of all this chaos, there was one man who walked away with a hundred million dollars in profit, Mr. Jones himself. He gained quite the reputation because of this trade, especially with a PBS documentary named Trader. It covered his life throughout 1987, but Jones wasn't really a fan of the documentary, so he tried his best to take it out of circulation. Also, unlike Livermore, Jones continued his success and is currently rated by Forbes as one of the highest earning hedge fund managers in the world, with a personal net worth of over $8 billion. And number eight, Andy Krieger, fighting the Kiwi. The Black Monday phenomenon grabbed a lot of eyeballs in the trading world, and a certain pair of these eyes belonged to an aggressive trader by the name of Andy Krieger, who started to focus on currencies that were rallying against the US dollar. As expected, pretty much every investor tried to seek comfort in other currencies that didn't suffer as much as the dollar, and one such currency was the New Zealand dollar, also known as the Kiwi. Krieger wanted to counter the Kiwi, so he used options, which was a relatively new method at the time. 
Even so, he shorted the Kiwi by hundreds of millions of dollars, with some reports even claiming that the cumulative short was around $1 billion, which was almost as much as New Zealand's entire money supply. This gave Krieger more control than the New Zealand government, so they rallied to prevent the short but failed to do so. They even called Krieger's bosses at Bankers Trust. But the pressure on the Kiwi became too much for the market to bear, and all the traders followed suit. Eventually, the Kiwi slipped by 5%, and Krieger's short minted a massive profit of $300 million. This was a legendary achievement, but Krieger himself had said he was only paid a tiny bonus of $3 million, meaning 1% of the total profits. This eventually led him to leave Bankers Trust and work at another organization. And number seven, Louis Bacon, betting on war. This is a man who can predict international politics better than the CIA. Louis Bacon was also one of the few Black Monday winners along with Paul Tudor Jones, but that was nowhere near his biggest victory. Bacon had a rather shaky start to his career, dealing in losses for a prolonged period of time and relying on his inheritance till he could finally earn some profits and eventually start his own company in 1990, More Capital Management. He started paying close attention to the antagonistic trends of Saddam Hussein's regime against the oil-rich Kuwait. That's when Bacon tried something unorthodox, by going long on oil and short on stocks via macro investments. So when the Iraqi tanks ended up crossing the border and escalating international relations, Bacon simply watched his profits doing the same. His company started off with a fund of approximately $100 million, and by the end of the year, it earned a return of a ridiculous 86%. Official figures were never released on this trade, probably because it was coupled with another brilliant move to short the Nikkei index when the Japanese markets collapsed. Either way, Bacon turned himself into a Wall Street legend and continues to impress with his company making returns of around 25 to 35% yearly. And number six, Jim Chanos, Enron's arch nemesis. We've got another notorious short seller in the form of Jim Chanos. And the reason he's here is because of his Enron trade that saw him churn out a profit of $500 million. To understand how this worked out for him, we need to go back to the 1980s where he managed to take down a US insurance company called Baldwin United. Chanos noticed that they had been selling insurance policies and then cooking up their books based on potential sales that simply did not exist. After a successful short that resulted in Baldwin's bankruptcy, Chanos made enough money to start his own hedge fund, Kynikos, in 1985. It's kind of apt too, because Kynikos translates to cynic in Greek. Now, his Enron heroics began with a harmless phone call from an old pal asking him to check out an article talking about energy companies successfully lobbying the SEC to allow mark to model and mark to mark accounting to be used for their businesses. For the uniforms, these methods would permit these companies to take the current value of their future profits and to add them to their current accounts. This prompted Chanos and his team to examine Enron and they soon noticed tons of red flags, such as using the mark to mark accounting to cook their books and boost income while hiding their losses in the form of discounts. This was Baldwin all over again. So Chanos took his position and shorted Enron in November 2000, when their stock price hit $90 despite the predicted target being $130. What followed was maybe the most stunning company collapse and financial fraud in the history of Wall Street. But Chanos didn't care because he got his bag. And number five, George Soros, betting against the British pound. This is easily one of the most famous trades ever, having earned George Soros the title of the man who broke the Bank of England. In 1992, the British economy was doing just fine, but as part of the European exchange rate mechanism, the pound had to be within 6% against the other currencies within the same system. The problem for the Bank of England was that the German mark was performing strongly with low inflation, and Britain's inflation was almost triple of that. Their hopes of the ERM reducing inflation was quickly noticed by Soros and his team at the Quantum Fund. He began to borrow heavily in order to short the pound while the Bank of England raised their interest rates to 12% in an effort to delay the inevitable. This caused other investors to question the pound's stability as paying back the interest on a struggling currency would rack up billions in bills. Soon enough, the Bank of England had to exit the ERM and watch the pound decline by 25% 
highlighting a day that would go on to be called Black Wednesday. Soros walked out smiling from this debacle as he had made $1 billion from his gamble. This gave him a notorious reputation as he was looked at as a man who had the audacity to attack the currency of what looked like a well-performing economy. At number 4, Stanley Druckenmiller, a double bet on the Deutschmark. Stanley Druckenmiller actually worked at Quantum Fund with George Soros. And get this, one of his moves could very well have been in collaboration with the Soros trade to form a legendary double play of Forex trades. His first play was betting on the Deutschmark during the fall of the Berlin Wall. With the prospects of reunification looming, the mark's position seemed a bit too excessive for Druckenmiller's liking. He began a multi-million dollar bet which eventually turned into two billion dollars when Soros offered his support after going through the research. Our close allies. This rally played to their advantage, bringing in returns of 60%. This had probably pushed Druckenmiller to land his second play when Soros destroyed the Bank of England. He sensed an opportunity to bet on the mark once again and began his play by purchasing British stocks under the assumption that they'd fall, which they did in drastic fashion. He also bought German bonds, hoping for exports to increase, which did happen because of the fallout of the pound. This trade landed an extra billion dollars to the quantum fund. Druckenmiller and Soros have parted ways since then, especially due to the dot-com crash that cost billions. But they're both sitting comfortably as billionaires today. And number three, Kyle Bass, The Big Short Part One. We've all seen The Big Short and heard of Michael Burry, Steve Eisman, and a few other traders who were highlighted by Hollywood. But there were two other major winners from the catastrophe that was the US subprime mortgage market right before the 2008 financial crash. One of them is Kyle Bass, who made billions from 2007's credit default swap trades. He'd been a successful trader, having started his own firm, Heyman Capital Management, back in 2006. However, the chain of events that landed him a massive payout all started with a wedding in Spain, where he had a chat with an investment banker from New York. He told Bass about some subprime CDO market, and this led Bass to hire some private investigators to do some research on the US mortgage market. He then used this data to ascertain which residential mortgage-backed securities were high risk and most likely to default. What followed was something unbelievable. He purchased CDSs as a bet against the subprime mortgage market, which was in essence the entire global financial system. He even got additional investors to come on board, resulting in a profit of almost $4 billion for his hedge fund. And number two, John Paulson, The Big Short Part Two. Kyle Bass was player number one. The other big winner happened to be John Paulson, who despite managing around $100 million by the middle of the decade, was not seen as a big player in the eyes of Wall Street. One fine day, his analyst, Paolo Pellegrini, started to look into the US housing market. While Michael Burry may have been the first to notice the cracks, Paulson was the one who managed to raise around $150 million from his investors. He then convinced the banks to sell him a ton of credit default swaps, which was an insurance against debt. It was just a waiting game after that. And in 2007, when it all started to fall apart, Paulson's investors couldn't believe it when he revealed their profits were at 66%. On some days, his fund was making over a billion dollars a day and eventually raked in around $20 billion by the time the markets had completely collapsed. Paulson's personal take from this was a whopping $4 billion. And at number one, David Tepper attacking the banks. In 2009, only a fool would have thought of buying bank stocks, but David Tepper had a whole other vision. Tepper was always known as a volatile trader, but his results spoke for themselves especially when he came out of the 2008 crisis only 25% down. His investors kept their faith in him, and this paid back huge dividends. While everyone was still reeling from their losses, Tepper saw the long game and moved his fund, Appaloosa Management, into the most dangerous market at the time, banking. No matter what the investors were saying, he felt that the banks would rally. This was probably because he studied a government paper in February 2009, announcing a financial stability plan to shore up the banks. Basically, the government was buying bank stocks which would then be converted into common shares at prices which were exceeding the current value. 
This led Tepper to purchase stocks of the biggest banks at low values and high volume. His most common targets were Citigroup and Bank of America, in addition to almost $1 billion worth of AIG's commercial mortgage securities. After a patient waiting game, he saw his investments double, triple, and even quadruple within a year. Tepper's fund came back with 132.7% net returns, and the man himself made a ridiculous $7 billion. He's won several accolades since then and continues to mint money. Although he does have his fair share of losses too, the point remains that people still talk about how he must have had balls of steel to make such a daring move at the time. Like, share, and subscribe if you liked the video, and feel free to suggest any topics you'd like to see in my future videos. See you soon, and happy trading!